Um, and I want to talk to you tonight about um, I, perhaps, probably culturally speaking, the most offensive passage in Scripture. Okay, so uh, the, the more often, more more often than not, some people when we when we kind of ingest who Jesus is from a cultural understanding, um, we th- there seems to be this. Uh, part of the story that's missing, right? If I just pitch to the idea of Jesus from a cultural perspective, it doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Um, culturally speaking, Jesus is kind of like this peace-loving hippie that kind of walked through planet Earth. He had a lot of really great things to say, like a house divided against itself cannot stand, love your neighbor as yourself. And then all of a sudden, people got really bent out of shape and decided they were going to crucify him and that's why we have Easter, right? That, that we, just, we don't really have a, a great understanding. And I think a lot of the reason is, is we, we have to understand how much of our understanding of Jesus and the Bible comes from the culture that we live in versus the actual scripture itself. Okay, so you guys ever seen Alice in Wonderland? Okay, so there's one dude in there, and he, uh, the Mad Hatter, right? And he's got this big hat on, and it says like 10 over 6. Whoa, Okay. <laughs> Um, and whoever's job this is to follow me around deserves a raise because I'm, a, I'm, I'm like a ninja. Okay, um, the Mad Hatter uh, is a very common expression. The reason is, is because in the olden times, um, when they would construct a hat to make it waterproof, they would use a certain chemical called mercury. And the mercury that was used to uh, solidify hats from weather and rain and things like that we find out much later on, makes you crazy. So when you went to each and every town, the person who was in charge of building hats was always a crazy person because they were working with mercury all day long and then it seeped into their bloodstream then it made them psychotic. So we came up with this, and and then we thought that all the crazy people like making hats rather than understanding that people making hats become crazy people. It's a very backwards way of seeing things. My point in that is sometimes we have to do some kind, some kind of a personal inventory to ask ourselves, what are the things that we find true about Jesus that the Bible says nothing about? Or, or to, to ask another way, are there promises of God that you're holding on to that he's never made to you? Are there assurances that you grip, that you tell yourself at night, that you have on plastered on some coffee mug at your house, but if you actually did the due diligence of opening the scriptures like Paul warns the Bereans liked to do, would you find that our, uh, some, in some cases our, our whole faith system is kind of this house of cards? The reason I think there's import in doing that is because this is the season of life that you're both in and that you're going into, and for a lot of us, we've already, we've already experienced this world's kind of fraught with problems and difficulties and issues and grievances and suffering and, and death. And, and, and in a room of this size, if I said, how many of you have experienced suffering? How many of you have experienced grief, the loss of a loved one, divorce, either from your parents or personally, the, the feeling of being alone, lost, wandering, suicidal ideation, self-harm? I, I, I don't, I'm embarrassed to ask that question because I'm not quite sure there'd be a single hand that wasn't up. But if you grew up in the church like I did, there was, there was kind of this idea that you, when you get to church, you kind of send your avatar into the sanctuary, right? The, I, I, was, I watched Chris Brown talk last night about this same idea, but, but this, is kind of, this is kind of how I understood the church, right? Like I grew up in the South, right, in Oklahoma. And so as such, my mom had like that big old hair, right? Like higher the hair, the closer to heaven. You feel me? <laughs> and... So we'd be like on our way to church and she'd be like, I'm gonna beat you. She'd be like smacking us with like fly swatters, books, whatever she could find, okay? Because her arms were short. And so if you were really intelligent, you sat in the seat behind mom. My dad was a Lutheran pastor, so he wasn't in the car. It was just my mom who took us to church. So if you were smart, you sat in the seat directly behind her because then she's, she can't get it. And if she does, she just kind of nicks you. And then you act like it really hurt so she doesn't do it again. If you're smart, right? If you're straight dumb, Whenever your parents smack you, you go, that didn't even hurt, right? <laughs> that, is the, like, that is the language of the masochist, right? Yeah, who cares? Anyway, um, then you get to church, and she'd open her car door. She'd be like, hi, bless your heart. Hello, everyone. How are we doing today? And this is some of our, while it's funny to laugh at my mom, right? No, just kidding. Well, that's, <laughs> it, it's true, right? Because you look at it, and you go, that's ridiculous. But I think we run... A lot of us run kind of a very similar scheme. We run a very similar playbook, right? And maybe you don't have permed hair or maybe you, didn't, you don't have a southern drawl. 
But there is kind of this, this understanding that you, you, the danger of Christianity is you can get good at it, right? You watch it enough. Like you can watch secular people watch Christians and you can watch them mimic us and you go, <laughs> that's pretty good, right? You nailed it. The fear then is a simple question that I think we all want to ask ourselves at like the deepest level. If the Holy Spirit left my life, how long would it take for me to realize it? And, and the, the, the Bible makes a lot of promises. And for whatever reason, in our context, we think that as long as you become a Christian or as long as there's a God up there somehow that he is going to offer some level of insurance, right, for our hearts, for our lives, for our well-being, for our finances. And the more we're dedicated to God, the more that he is gonna take care of us. And, and we cling to these promises, but these are promises like trying to grasp oil in your hand. It just it, it doesn't work. They're not true. But like the Mad Hatter, we have these ideas that have seeped into our skin and then we come across stuff in our life and we don't know what to do with it. We have these ideas that if we, were, if we are followers of God, if God's really there, if God's really loving, then what he's gonna do is he's, he's gonna protect me at least at a basic level, right? You might have resigned to the fact that you're not gonna be a Lamborghini guy or that girl that you like isn't going to give you the attention that you want even though you've been praying for it, but whatever, that was a pipe dream, Right? That was like your add-on prayer at the end of your real prayer, right? Oh, and by the way, if Jennifer could like look my direction, right? <laughs> and you just kind of throw it up there and you're like, I'm just kidding, but for real, <laughs> right? <It's laughs> I'll become a monk, okay. But then something happens. You observe the world around you and unless you're wrapped up in a coffin of your own navel gazing through your whole life, you see that the, the world is different than we think God promised it to be. When, uh, right after my wife had our fifth kid, her name was Finley, our little daughter, came into the world in 59 minutes, born in the corner of our bedroom, which was, it was terrifying, okay? <laughs> He's like, we should be at a hospital, but here we are. Um, my wife started having these, this back pain, and that back pain got diagnosed as, as a pulmonary embolism, which um, can kill you without you even knowing it. People just go to sleep and don't wake up from it. I went to the hospital. She was diagnosed with it. She got really afraid that if she went to sleep that it would kill her. So she stopped sleeping, and she stopped sleeping for 10 days straight. The doctor said if you don't sleep for 10 days, if you take away someone's food, water, and sleep, sleep almost always kills them first. And if it doesn't kill them, if they've got the perseverance to endure that, the person that's returned to you after 10 days of no sleeping is not of sound mind. They don't think correctly. Their, their brain at a fundamental level will be haywire. It will be different. On day seven, my wife started talking about suicidal thoughts and suicidal ideation. And this is, a, I mean, we're talking about she graduated college at the age of 19, uh, won a national championship, graduated with honors summa cum laude of her university, and then married me seven days later. Within eight days, she graduated with honors at the age of 18, at the age of 19, got married and won a national championship, and she was just getting started. Then started four at-home businesses, homeschooled all five of our kids, and it, it, it was like she wasn't even trying. And then all of a sudden, that same woman is talking about self-harm and suicidal thoughts and intrusive thoughts that she can't get a hold of, and there's simple prayers that go out in moments like that. Like, God, would you relieve this? Would you fix this? Give me my wife back. Why, is, why, are, why don't you intervene, right? I feel like so many of our prayers are so freaking sanitized sometimes, you know? Like, God, help me on my math test. And I, I'm not even, um, I mean, I guess God listens to those prayers, but I don't think he does anything, right? Like, you know, it's like, I don't know. But then the deep cries of our heart, you know, why... why why are you like this? Why am I alone? Why don't you see me? This, this really sounds like the Psalms, right? You find me a Psalm that prays for a math test, I'll give you $1,000, right? <laughs> it doesn't make Bible. People, I'm sure people prayed prayers that were one way or another, but isn't it so ironic what God says? I want you to print that one, right? Psalm 73, why do wicked people prosper and righteous people perish? Why are you a God like that? God goes, I like that one. Put that one in there. <laughs> right? 
How long, O Lord, will you wait while I'm crying out to you in the wilderness, in the desert, from the pits of hell? I cry out to you day by night, but you do not answer me. Why? God's like, yep, that one would work too. And and for whatever reason, the more that we make Christianity copacetic and the more that we make Christianity sanitized, the more that you go through the crap of life and you think, I've got to figure this out because God is a God of the neat and the tidy and the clean and the, 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 the idea that everything in his kingdom has this Germanic expression of, of every being, Einstein, Einstein, like this is the kingdom of God. And if we've got our lives messed up or if our prayers get a little too dangerous or a little too wild or we start really just crying out or freaking out, the, the church can and we can even perceive that God's going, why don't you go get well? Why don't you take a season off? Why don't you back off? And then when you're ready to come to God with, with, with your life intact, with your thoughts intact, with your prayers intact, then God's gonna be ready to have a conversation. And we as a church are gonna be ready to receive you, but you gotta get better first, which is completely contrary to the idea that come to me all who are weak and heavy burdened and I will give you rest. So she is in this state where she's having the suicidal ideation. She goes to the doctor and they, they read her trauma line of her brain. Did you know you had a trauma line? Now you do, okay? And so they do this test on her and the average person's trauma line is about a two or a three. People who come back from Iraq register about a 32. She was registering a 64. So it's a constant idea that you're gonna die takes away your brain's ability to process life in any realistic sort of way. It's total betrayal at that point and we watched her kind of descend into madness, and the doctor's saying, avoid trauma. If you wanna help her get better, she needs to avoid trauma. She needs deep help, a lot of psychotherapy, medicate, uh, there's just a lot that she needs, but first, you gotta get her out of trauma. So it was my, um, every week I go, or every week, every year I go up to Hume Lake and I teach, and so it's my turn to go up to Hume Lake. And so I'm up at Hume Lake and I'm teaching about the truth of God, about the reality of suffering in the world, I'm presenting the gospel message on Tuesday night up there and this woman calls me off stage. She's like, you need to get off stage right now. And I'm like, did I go over my time? And she's like, no, come with me right now. I was like in the middle of it. And we're sprinting across Hume Lake's campus to find my son, Leonidas. He's my second youngest, we call him Leo. Completely unresponsive. And my wife's sleeping pills were all gone. And so they thought that he had taken all those sleeping pills And the firefighter told me and my wife at the time, he said to us, if this is what happened, there's nothing that we can do for him. Get in your van and follow us down the mountain, but it's two hours away from the nearest hospital. We can't life flight anyone out of here because it's the middle of the night. Just keep your distance because if I pull over and need to try to resuscitate your son, I don't want you to run into the back of the ambulance. And and I get the Lamborghini prayers. I get like the prayers for, I get all those things. But like as a pastor, like preaching the gospel, to have a prayer so simple to stay away from trauma in this season of life, and then to have your son become unresponsive and have all this stuff take place. I was, I just remember, like going down that mountain, like just yelling, like screaming in the car. It was just me because my wife was in the back of the ambulance, and my kids had to be watched by someone that they didn't know, and they're freaking out because dad's leaving in the middle of the night with mom, and and they don't get it. And I remember thinking the the idea of what are you doing? Like, what the, the, this is like, the, this, is a, this would be a great, great physician moment. And the problem with me, I teach master's level systematic theology, master's level apologetics. I'm a professor by trade, and I am a pastor at a church, and I, but this is what I do. And so my problem is not that I don't know scripture, it's that I know it well enough that I'm starting to recite it back to him. Where are you? How many of you, if your child asked for bread, would give him a snake instead? Did you know that's biblical? Am I not a child of God? Bread, no trauma, help, peace, comfort, reality, bring, send, fix, change. And you gave me a snake. I wasn't confused about what I didn't know about scripture. I was putting the very things I did know about scripture before the foot of God and going, you said you would. And you're not. My son ended up getting diagnosed with acute onset cerebralitis, which means that my son Brady threw all the pills down the toilet in happenstance, and at the same time, my son in the other room just fell over unconscious. 
which in one case you can go, oh, that's great. The problem with that is that the doctor gave us one command when you go up to Hume Lake, keep Paige away from trauma. And my wife in the corner of the room, just her eyes were glazed over. So we go back home, we seek more treatment. She's waking up in the middle of the night and doing really strange things. She's, one day we're standing on the edge of, of uh, our living room up on the second floor and it kind of overlooks the living room and she just jumped off the balcony and landed below and then looked up at me and it said, what is wrong with my brain? And I, I, didn't, I don't have an answer. And if you've never experienced or walked with someone or, or sat front row to mental illness, it's one of the most scariest things ever. So he was like, I, I thought to myself, it's time to pull out all the stops. So there's a long-term inpatient treatment center in Tucson, Arizona. And this place, it was, it was like, it was, I, I literally Googled best PTSD trauma center in the United States, right? And they didn't take my insurance. And I, everyone warned me like, hey, don't, you know, they don't take your insurance. It's $40,000 for a month. Don't go there. And I was, you know how small $40,000 sounds when it's your beloved's life on the line? It's, a, it's, a, it's the dumbest crap I've ever heard. People were like, that's expensive. I'm like, bro, I will sleep naked on the side of the road for the rest of my life if I can get my wife back. Gary, you know, like, <laughs> what? It's expensive, okay. And then I'm starting to feel like, oh, I get it. You, there's such a stigma to mental health that you're gonna make us like the beacon poster child of mental health and, and we're gonna go to this treatment center and she's gonna become well and then we're gonna travel around and we're gonna talk to people about the stigma of mental health and how it has its place in the church and that Jesus is the, is the solution for anxiety and all these things and this is, this, I, I finally see your plan. You've, crea- you've created doctors and medicine and psychotherapy and everything else as this is the gift, this is the blessing, this is the tool by which she's gonna get well. On day eight, I get a call that she's killed herself. In that moment, your only response is a dad of five, a newly single dad of five, is is you've got a picture of God that you're holding up, and then you've got the reality and the crap that you're going through, and something, one of these two is wrong. Either my idea that I had about God is wrong or in somehow in reality what I was seeing, what I was perceiving, what I was thinking and, and, and what I assumed was wrong and I didn't know which picture to rip up. I'm sitting on like the floor of my kid's room thinking about the reality of this moment. I gotta call her dad and say, when I told you that I was gonna take care of your daughter, I failed at my job. I've gotta, I've gotta process. You can go to seminary all you want. Do you have a class that explain to your six-year-old son why mom both loves you and killed herself and isn't coming back? That's not a class. But my point is, this is the reality of our lives. No, yeah, I hope you don't grow up one day and you have some experience that's like this, but you might have one worse. And if your life isn't bulletproof, if your life, do, if you're not ready to stand in there, like you know, the, marriages aren't judged by their ability to vacation together. They're judged in the throes. They're judged in the pain. They're judged in the suffering. They're judged in trial. They're judged in that. So is your faith. It's tested and it's tried in those things. And what is your, when that day comes for you, and you'll notice that when scripture opens up and you read it, the promises of God aren't, you're never gonna experience pain, you're never gonna have issues, you're never going to, here's the promises of God. In this world, you will have trouble. John chapter uh, 14, the world is gonna hate you. (laughs) That's a promise. And if the world doesn't hate you, you've become too much like the world. That's a problem. These are the promises of God, but he also promises his presence. He promises paradise someday. He promises persecution in the meantime. So what is our plan? What is our solution? What is the truth of your life? I'm I'm phenomenally fascinated with the idea of truth. In a generation, like I literally chat GPT'd, write a sermon on truth today. It wasn't great. It it was better than this, but it wasn't great. It wasn't great. (laughs) And truth is such an interesting idea 
because as a generation that has information at our fingertips more than any other generation ever has, right? Like when I was a kid, I'm 34, so I'm not like, when I was a boy, <laughs> we didn't even have electricity. <laughs> we threw rocks at each other. It was so fun. But I remember like pre-internet, right? I was like 10 years old or like nine years old. I remember my dad was like, this is the internet. And I was like, that's some voodoo stuff. Throw it out the door, you know? <laughs> He's like, everyone's going to be connected. I was like, well, this fad's going to wear it after a while. Uh, it didn't. It's still going. But I remember when like, you were like, man, what was the guy's name that played Batman? And guess what? You just didn't know. <laughs> you just, you're like, ah, crap. I guess. Hope I find someone smarter than me that can answer my question. Right? And then like 10 years later, you're like, Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer. But right now, before I could finish the question, you could be right there, right? You would know exactly what it was. The, 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 the problem is, is that the biblical idea of truth requires discernment. You see, we're, we're drowning in information, but as a culture, we're starving for truth. And, and we think that the stomach that is hungry in our soul for truth can be satisfied by information, and it's not. And the post-Christian nation that has come in has said that tr whatever is true is whatever is true for you and whatever is true for me is true for me. Which means what gives me worth is subjective to my experience and what gives you worth is subjective to your experience. The problem with that is that in a room of this size, three, four hundred people, whatever it might be, we're all trying to judge ourselves then in that idea of finding our worth and identity and value and, and, and self-perception and, and worth and we're all playing different games to get there. The problem is that part of my game requires you to satisfy part of my game. I need you to tell me that I'm doing a good job. Every Disney movie right, right now is the same theme. Everyone wants you to be A, but you go be whatever letter you want to be. Right? No, 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 no. Stick to the stuff you know. The one simple rule is mess with the rules. Don't map on the phone. No, no. Exactly, right? <laughs> like, the whole movie is like, I play basketball, don't you think? But I want to bake crap. <laughs> right? <laughs> what about you? He's like, well, I want to, my name's Troy, and I, I want to sing, and, <laughs> right? And there's that one girl, she's like, I'm a break dancer. And you're like, you are a break dancer. <laughs> Right? Right, it's like frozen, right? Elsa's like, I have duty and responsibility, except now I'm gonna build a friggin' ice castle and cut a slit in my dress and walk around like, let it go, right? You're like, I can be whoever I wanna be, right? Don't, why well, the whole, I forgot the chorus. The whole chorus, though, is essentially, I don't hold it back anymore. Don't let them in, don't let them see. Be the good girl, right? She's saying the idea of me living a good life or doing my due diligence or, or, or being a good girl has historically been on what people think I'm doing, how well they think I'm doing. But enough of that. I'm going to tell myself what I do well. And in the last 15 years, in the, in the generational enterprise of the digital age sweeping our nation, the suicide rate among your generation has increased more than 100%. And the, the, the cultural critique of Christianity is the idea that we bow to a greater authority, but the punishment of modern self-determined identity and value and worth and morality is killing us. Because while I tell myself my identity is found whatever I want, I need you to validate that I'm doing a good job with that. I still need your help. The problem is you're so dang neurotic yourself that you don't have time to fulfill my thing because we are all so dang selfish intrinsically. Historically, it was a traditional culture where your parents told you you were doing a good job. Now we said, forget that. I'm gonna tell myself I'm doing a good job. And only in the marketplace of ideas does Christianity stand alone. Where Jesus says, let me help you with truth. 
Your value is not found in performance. Your value isn't found in achievement. Your value has been received, not achieved. Your value lies in your relationship to the one who created value in the first place. But we hand out scorecards to everyone in our life and ask them how we're doing. And for a lot of us, if we're honest, the scorecard that matters the least is the king. The one who made us. The one who invented your soul. The one who knit you together in your mother's womb, who knows every hair on your head. His scorecard, for whatever reason, counts for a fraction of the person sitting next to you. But the person sitting next to you is looking to you to validate them and you're looking to them to validate you and you wonder why you both feel empty. It's transactional. And I, I just, I love what Jesus says here in John chapter 14. And remember, the Masoretes come in at a much later point and put the, the number system inside the Gospels and inside the whole Bible, okay? Before that, there, John wasn't like, John 13, verse 1. No, he was this, we literally intercepted this dude's mail, and then we study it. And we study it by chapters, and then we stop, right? But he, imagine if someone intercepted your love letter to one of your friends, or um, they intercepted a letter that you were writing to your parents, and then they started memorizing and highlighting certain lines, of it, and then, and, and then creating your character around those few phrases. Like, imagine reading the story of Cinderella like this. There was a woman named Cinderella who didn't get her chores done. That night, because she hadn't finished her chores, she wasn't allowed to go to the ball. For me, Cinderella is a story of a girl who got exactly what she deserved, right? The, the expectations were very clear. You gotta finish your chores. She didn't get them done. Let's close in prayer. <laughs> right? So we go, no, 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 you gotta be dressed, right? <laughs> we read the Bible like we read no other book. <laughs> we piecemeal it together and then think we've gotten an actual understanding of Jesus. And so John chapter 14, verse one is a, is a verse that a lot of us know and it's powerful and it's, do not let your hearts be troubled. Jesus is speaking to his disciples and he says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Few of us understand the context of that because they put a chapter break between 13 and 14, okay? So the first verse of 14 is do not let your hearts be troubled, but the end of 13 is Jesus telling his right-hand guy that you're gonna betray me. You're gonna deny me three times. I'm gonna walk to a cross and you're all gonna abandon me. When someone strikes the shepherd, the sheep scatter and that's gonna be who you are and I'm leaving this place. Do you imagine the silence of that room? Then Jesus breaks it by saying this, do not let your hearts be troubled. Here's what he says, if you have your Bibles. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe, you trust in God, believe also in me. And then he starts with this really weird discourse. And without an understanding, this just sounds like a bunch of jargon. He says, in my father's house, there are many rooms. If it was not so, I would have told you. I'm gonna go there to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I'm gonna come back and get me that where I am there, you may be also. And we're like, neat, what in the heck are you talking about? But to an ancient Near Eastern first century Jew, they would have understood this language. It's wedding language. The wedding language, this is how it would work. When it was time for a betrothal, the betrothal process was, as a guy, I would go to the house of my beloved and I would go to her father and I would say, what is the price that I need to pay for the bride? So I would leave my father's house. Listen to the analogy. The groom's job is I need to leave my dwelling place. I need to leave my father's house and I need to bridge the chasm to my bride. And once I get there, I find that there's a price that needs to be paid to collect my bride. If I pay the price to collect my bride, then she becomes sanctified, set apart. There's a season then that can last up to a year where she is betrothed to me to, to consecrate that moment of me saying, she is mine and I am hers, but I can't have her hand in marriage yet because we don't have a place to live. We would validate that covenant that we're making to each other, even though we haven't finished the consummation of it yet, by drinking a cup of wine together. So I drink a cup in order to validate the fact that from here on out, this woman is set apart, sanctified for me. That's what the word holy means, set apart. She is now mine. Then, 
the groom goes back to his father's house because he has to build a dwelling place. Because in the insula that he came from, there was no place for him to raise a family. So he would go back and he would work and he would build a dwelling place. And once that place was finished, in the middle of the night, he would get a abandoned procession and the shoshben or the best man would go to the town and say, the, the room is done. And he would bring all the people of the wedding feast together and then the groom with his guys in tow and a procession would take a torch and they would walk across town to her house and to, so that she would know that he was coming. He shouts and he calls out her name directly and this lets everyone know that the price has been paid, the covenant is fulfilled, the cup has been drank, the dwelling place is prepared and the groom comes back in a shout to bring his bride out to be with him. Now, they go back over to the father's house and they consummate the marriage, okay? So, <laughs> sexual things. <laughs> then, after that union, then the bride has been veiled through this whole process. Who's the bride? What, clearly you know who the bride is, but it's theoretical. The bride comes out, the groom unveils the bride, and they start like a seven-day-long festival of joy and triumph and all these things, and everyone celebrates in what's happening. So Jesus is saying this. He's not saying, my relationship to you is kind of like a, oh, think about a wedding. Nope. That's backwards. Jesus is omniscient, omnipresent, omnibenevolent, omnipotent, all those things. So if God is omnipresent, is he present in all space at all times? Which he is. Good. Is God omnipresent in all time at all times? Yes. Because he's spaceless, timeless, and immaterial, and the space-time continuum that began was space, time, and material all at the same point, he's transcendent of all those things, which means he's bound by none of those things, which means that before there was everything, there was nothing except for the pre-existent God, the disembodied mind, which is neither spaceless, which is al always spaceless, timeless, and immaterial. Okay? So, God is not just in all places at all times. He's in all time at all times. And here is my postulation. When God looks at the consummation of the whole world to himself, when he brings back all believers and he comes back in his glory, he's already there right now. And then he goes back in history and he leaves like a trail of breadcrumbs so that we'll better understand what that day is going to be like. Marriage is not looking forward to what's happening. Marriage is God looking back so we'll understand it when it happens. You understand that? One is the shadow and one is the shadow caster. God's power is casting a shadow. So marriage, the whole marriage ceremony is Jesus saying right here, in my father's house, there are many rooms. I'm gonna go there and prepare a place for you. And once I've prepared that place for you, like a groom, I'm gonna step back over the darkness and call out your name in a shout that where I am there you may be also. Now, God has no intention of having a physical union consummation ceremony with any of us, but the idea here is that we will be, we'll have resurrected bodies and we will be with him in flesh, not just in spirit. We will have bodies of skin and bone. We will be able to touch things and understand the world, that taste fruit. We're not just gonna be like disembodied, heart-playing people on clouds. We'll have a physical body again. And after Jesus is talking about his deep love for them, like a groom loves a bride and sacrifices for and, and pleads for and builds a house for and does everything else, he says, Thomas responds in verse five, Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Every day, my son Leonidas, when I pick him up from, from preschool, he says, thank you, Dad, for coming and getting me today. Why is that, why is that, why, why did we say, ah? Uh? Because he doesn't get something, does he? We awe at his incompetence. We awe at his ignorance. Don't we? Why did you say, ah? Uh? Tell me, why did you say, ah? Uh? You say, ah, uh, because what does he not get? Of course I'm gonna come get you. You are my beloved. And this is what beloveds do. <laughs> Who doesn't understand our relationship? He don't. I know I'm coming back. Why wouldn't I? I've spoken to you a thousand times. Leo, I love you more than life itself. 
And if you ask Leo, does dad love you and would he never leave you, he'll say yes. But he still thanks me every day I show up. Do you want to know why? Because while he knows it with his mind, he doesn't know it in his conviction. He doesn't know it in his soul. And I'm afraid that way too many of us, and me included, we know that God loves us with our mind, but we don't actually convictionally know it in our soul. And that makes all the difference. Lord, we do not know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, and his is the most offensive phrase in our culture, in all of human history. Jesus answers and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really knew me, you will know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. So the the question is, in the myriad of problems and issues and suffering and and discontent in your life and and, and the way that you think and the way that you process things and and the hurt that you see around you, and and not just in your immediate experience, but every time you turn on the news or talk to your friends or interact with anyone, why is there suffering everywhere? What is truth? Nietzsche once said there is no such thing as truth. A guy named Fayer said that all truth comes from your perspective. There's other uh, uh, thinkers, Jungian theorians that would say, well, here's what it is. All truth is relative. So your truth is true to you and your truth is true to me. But what happens if your blue is my red? Who's true? Which one's true? It doesn't matter. There is no true red then and there is no true blue. And that's, that's an incoherent way of living your life. And Breyer says that truth can't be known, and, and, and Buddha says that, 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 that truth ultimately is not something that we should be grasped, but instead it's, it's to be rejected. It's, it, the ultimate truth of life is, 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 is a non-existent state, and it's to reach this nirvana, is to be asceticized from everything. And every single thinker who talks about truth is dead, except for one. But he didn't point at truth. He didn't claim that truth is relative. He didn't say that people can possibly know truth. He didn't say that truth is about your perspective. He didn't say that truth is an unknowable phenomenon. He didn't say there's no absolute truth. He pointed at himself. And then he said, truth is an idea. It's not what you think corresponds to reality. He says, I am the truth. Which means what he says is reality. Webster's definition of truth is that which corresponds to reality, but that is so fictitious because your reality and your reality might be different realities. Someone has to be the ultimate judge of reality and what is true and what is real and what is apparent and what is everything. And Jesus says, I am a trusty fulcrum by which you can all pivot around. I am that which you should orbit. I am the measuring stick for your goodness, for your morality, for your truth, for your life, for your value, for your identity. Everything else will topple and fail. Could you imagine how many of y'all in here have placed your identity in something that you can achieve or, or something that you can do, right? You might be really good looking, but you're about to get ugly. Do you get that? I'm 34 years old, right? And I remember being a young young, I remember being a young kid. (laughs) You'd like show up to Thanksgiving Day football when you were 12, you'd kick open the door and like sprint. Everything was fine. My body hurts every time I brush my teeth. I'm like, (laughs) I got tennis elbow, I think. Does anyone here a doctor? My elbow creaks. It's gonna fail you. Could you imagine building your life, building your identity and your value and the truth of who you are on something that's here today and gone tomorrow? But if we're introspectively asking that question, the majority of us, the champion of of importance in our hearts is something that can be taken away from you tomorrow. No wonder we're neurotic. With one failed swoop, with one blown ACL, with one change in market conditions, with one gash across your face, all your identity can go kaput. Why do we have anxiety? Why are we the most anxious generation ever? Because we don't know how to hold on to the things that we are clarifying and identifying ourselves with and we feel them slipping away every day, but we gotta fake it for Instagram that everything is going well. Do you know what the word anxiety really comes from in scripture? It's, it's, the, it's the tension of trying to live two lives. All anxiety at its core is me trying to project something while intrinsically I know something is false. It's the core of all of it. 
my pitch to you guys and, and what I want you to understand, and it, it's losing page is like the, it's the freaking hardest thing, man. But I'm, I'm not coming to you as someone who's like, well, now that I've resolved what everything is, I, I, I still fight with God. Like I, I have a hard time singing some songs. Do you? I have a struggle with not for a minute was I forsaken? You ever like skip certain phrases when you're singing because you're like, I don't know. (laughs) But I've got to do something in that moment. I either have to say, God, that's not true because that's not my experience or I say, my experience has betrayed the fact that you're the truth. And when your Bible tells me that you've never leave me, you will never leave me nor forsake me, when the Bible says in Romans chapter eight that Paul's speaking as someone who's been snake bitten, shipwrecked, beaten within an inch of his life on more than one occasion, who has been absolutely wrecked and ridiculed and who will lose his head in Nero's circus, he still has the power to say this. I am convinced, Paul writes, that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor death nor anything else in all of creation can separate me from the love of God which is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. I either have to believe that that's true or me, like a blind referee, have to walk around life throwing flags saying, God, you're not good. God, that's not true. God, that, but I don't know truth if it would punch me in the face if it's outside of Jesus. And if it's subjective, my truth can change every day. And the difficulty of being a young adult in our culture is as soon as you hang out with a new group of friends, your truth tends to change. Why are we so impressionable? Because we just want with, the, with every fiber of our being to be wanted, to be needed, to fit in and have our identity satisfied. Which means if you don't know who you are when you walk in a room, someone will change it. We are chameleonic to our core. And so there are, those, there are two types of people who follow Jesus. Those who follow him as the ultimate truth and source of truth. And there are those who are, who are transpositionally saying, for a season I'm gonna project that I follow him, but then crap's gonna hit the fan of your, in your life and you're gonna betray it. Or someone's gonna come along and they're finally gonna fill that chasm of loneliness in your soul. And you don't care what they believe or what they follow. Because the king of your life is to feel wanted, to experience sexual pleasure, and to be in a marital relationship. And so you sacrifice this whole God thing so that you can finally be known by somebody. But I come to you as someone who was married for a decade and then lost their wife overnight. It doesn't work. And I promise it's not because I found the wrong girl. Because that's what we think. Well, if you knew a love like I know, Bull crap. You will, I mean, that, that, the depth of a relationship when you walk someone through that is, but it never worked. And if you think, if you're seeking someone to fill your identity, when you find them, you're gonna crush them because you're gonna worship them. And whatever you idolize, you'll ultimately demonize because it didn't satisfy you. Only the cross of Christ can do that. So I come to you from the future I am coming to you from your future and telling you that there is a secret to contentment that Paul writes about in Philippians chapter four. That if you don't believe this, you will spend the next 15 years paying dumb tax in your own lives and you'll be miserable because you will chase the rat race of culture that says the reason you're sad is because she wasn't the right one. But once you find the right one, the reason that you're sad is because you haven't slept with enough girls. And when you find the right one, the reason that you're sad is because you haven't, you haven't, you haven't gotten the right job. You haven't gotten to the right school. And so we keep, why does the Bible say again and again, do not be deceived because we are prone to deception. So Jesus stands in the middle of your life right now and he says, what if, what if what I think about you was more important than what the person next to you thinks about you? I know it's a crazy idea, but what if what I think about you is more important than what they think? Because for the next 45 trillion years and some, you will be looking back on this 70 years of life and feel like the goofiest, worst investment you ever made. Trying to find worth and identity in the person sitting next to you or value in this life outside of Christ is like investing in a tent on the sand in low tide. And there will come a point in your life where you realize this truth. It is only when you've tasted the emptiness of this world that you will understand the sufficiency of Jesus. 
You know how powerful it is? You know how easy it is to sit in front of a room of young adults and go, I've got a crystal ball. Let me guess. You're experiencing anxiety, and everyone's like, this guy's good. <laughs> Let me guess. Your world is plagued with suffering and misunderstanding. You're like, well, how does he know my story? Because it's all of our stories. And the most deceived group in the history of the Christian church is single Christians. It's you, but guess what? It's me too. Not often you get to hear a pastor that's not married go, guys, I know singleness is hard, but me and my wife are having great sex every single night. (laughs) But y'all, if you trusted the Bible, you wouldn't care, right? I go home to Starlight Night every night, and she's smoking hot. (laughs) But you... You don't, don't, you don't need that. <laughs> you should be satisfied in Christ. <laughs> I get it, right? I get it. I promise you, I understand. But we've, Satan's favorite lie to tell young, young single Christians is that your life's about to start. When we should be the absolute force of the church, because we are not distracted by anything. But what distracts us? We feel like we're JV. And as soon as I find him, then I'm ready to start serving the church. Paul says, oh no. You got that backwards. Every church in San Diego County should be led by, fueled by, catalyzed by you. Don't sit on the sidelines of that. That's truth. Don't be deceived. Look, I I love you guys a lot. I don't even know who you people are. (laughs) But I'm in the area now too. And I want to see our churches thrive. I don't give a rip if you ever come to College Ave. I hope you have a church that you serve at. It's probably better than than my church because my church is led by a moron. (laughs) (laughs) But I did date his wife in college. (laughs) It's me. I'm the guy who leads the church. So if you did... (laughs) This guy's real bad. He's. <laughs> but if you don't bulletproof your life by finding your identity in something bigger than your current circumstances, you're, you're destined to fall away from Jesus. I just don't want that. May we all put everything we have into who he is. And in the meantime, let's wreck hell because of what we've been put in this position at this time to do for such a time as this. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for the the simple truth that you left your father's house and walked across the great divide. You heard the price that was necessary to win us back and to pay for us and it was costing your own life. Then you paid that price. You gave us a new name. You set us apart for yourself. But now we find this waiting game when we know that we are in you. We know that you've called us your own, but we're not with you yet. We're not in eternity yet, and we've got a mission to do here. God, we are plagued by these insecurities and these this lack of self confidence and this this way our wayward hearts are prone to wander away from you. And we we apologize for the moments in our life where we find value in something that isn't you. We want, we want better than that and, and we want you and more of you and we want more of your truth. We want to know that you're the way and the truth and the life and God, but as culture pushes in on us and, and challenges us and considers us less than and whatever, would you just throw away every lie from Satan right now? Would you inspire the hearts of us as single Christians to do your work and not wait until someone fulfills our identity, which will never happen unless that person is you? Thank you for your gift of your sacrifice. Jimmy, pray. Amen.